Okay, so for the second part of the lecture, I'm going to delve into a specific kind of method, um, which is what's called electrophysiological methods. So these are recording the electrical activity of neurons, either invasively or non-invasively, so at the scalp. Uh, next week, I'll talk about a, a couple of other key methods around uh, fMRI, um, brain stimulation, and uh, neuropsychology. So the first uh, thing here, just to pick up on the, uh, the first part, is one of the things we're trying to do is figure out how the, the world out there, so our faces, our colours, our experiences, are represented by the world in here, so the firing or activity uh, of neurons. How does it do that? So here we can talk about things like mental representation. So these are things like objects or colours or mental representation might be, for instance, of our grandmother. So these kinds of concepts or ideas uh, that we kind of have. And then we can talk about neural representations. So how is it, for instance, that we represent our grandmother within our brain? I'll tell you why we keep talking about our grandmother, because it uh, relates to the idea of grandmother. Uh, what is the kind of the neural code for these kinds of uh, properties? And again, it's not straightforward how we link these, and really it's that one is kind of a more cognitive uh, level description, and the other is uh, out of necessity in the wet stuff of the brain. And really the, the puzzle here is one in which um, these are all our stuff of cognition, uh, personality, emotions, memory, language, and so on. And the question is, how does the brain do this? And in fact, if you look drill down in the brain, obviously we know that there are neurons and chemicals uh, and so on, but we don't have necessarily separate chemicals for dealing with language in the brain or for memory and so on. All, it's all coming from the same cells. It's all coming from neurons, which all work, broadly speaking, along the same principles uh, of electrical and chemical uh, activity. So there is a lack of diversity, I suppose, in terms of how neurons function, but nevertheless they create this amazing diversity in terms of what we do and what we experience. So how is it that we uh, deal with this kind of uh, few-to-many uh, kind of mapping? Well, just as a bit of a recap as to how uh, neurons uh, function electrically, just to kind of explain how these methods work, Obviously, we've got um, the, the neuron here, which is made up of different uh, processes, what are called dendrites uh, and axons. And the axons carry these things called action potentials, which are rapid changes in um, uh, the, the voltage across uh, the membrane. And these rapid changes then flow throughout the axon uh, here. And the idea is that what cells are doing is that they're adding together the, the flow of multiple uh, electrical signals. So here, this cell here is receiving electrical information coming down these axons. What happens when the action potential gets to the end is that they release chemicals, and then these chemicals set off another chain of uh, electrical activity in the dendrites. Um, the electrical activity in the dendrites is a little bit different. So dendrites don't conduct action potentials. You have something called passive conduction. Um, it's just like passing a, uh, an electrical charge kind of through uh, the, the cell body of the dendrites, whereas axons carry these. So there are different ways of carrying electricity throughout neurons, and actually different uh, measures of recording are sensitive to, to either uh, action potentials or the dendrites and basically with this neuron here is that if all of this electrical activity coming from the other neurons sums up to a certain amount, then that triggers a discharge there and you've got this flow of uh, charged uh, electrical ions in and out and an action potential is generated and then this propagates down and you get this kind of chain reaction uh, in effect. And that's effectively how neurons are... Um, uh, um, communicating with each other electrically. But how are they then representing properties of the world out there? Well, basically, the idea here is that neurons have different specialisms. 
in the same way in terms of the kinds of information they process. So in the same way as in the first part of the lecture, I talked about the brain being made up of different specializations, different regions being specialized for a, say, speech perception, speech production. You've got this happening at a different kind of spatial scale, too, at the level of individual neurons. And obviously, it's the idea of individual neurons tending to do the same thing and being close to each other that gives rise to these blob-like kind of centimeter level specializations that uh, you see in FMI. But neurons produce action potentials, and the height of this action potential is fixed. So this is not very informative for carrying information. But what does change is the number of action potentials or the rate. So some neurons will produce lots of action potentials in response to a stimulus, but zero in response to, uh, to others. So they have a, a kind of selective response. So the way in which you can uh, uh, think about this is like in the schematic. So I've not put it on here, but what is implicit is that this is kind of time going along the x-axis, if you will. And here, this is kind of voltage change. So each one of these things is an, uh, a neuron discharging uh, action potentials. And what you, you can effectively do is to kind of count up these, and this gives you uh, an idea of what it is that the, the neuron is preferentially coding, what kind of information in the real world it is responding to. So if we look at neuron one and we kind of count up, we can see that neuron one is producing lots of actual potentials in response to a face, and only a few in terms of the others. Typically, uh, neurons won't have zero. They have what's called spontaneous activity that they kind of chatter. It's, it's almost as if there's electrical noise in the brain occasionally, though, just of course slightly. So the, the, we're not looking at zero values. But if we look at other neurons, and again, this is hypothetical for now, we might find a different profile. So neuron 2 responds to music uh, or sounds, for instance, but it doesn't respond to faces, to movement, or to colour. Neuron 3 um, responds to other kinds of things, so it responds, in this case, to faces, to movement, to colour, but not to, uh, to music. So it might be that neuron 3 is uh, a kind of a visual neuron, but it processes or receives information about multiple kinds uh, of, of vision. It's not just one kind of vision. Why is it that neurons uh, tend to respond to some things and not others? Well, that's a good question. Uh, it may be innate, but it, it probably reflects the way that the brain is structured, that they have limited inputs and outputs. So the reason why some neurons respond to visual information is literally that they are a few synapses away from the retina, it is often the case. It's not anything more fancy than that. So these things are kind of quite hardwired in terms of what connects with what determines that. So the question here is, um, how specific can this uh, coding be? So for instance, if you've got neurons that respond um, to vision, then would you ever find a neuron in your brain that responds, for instance, to the sight um, of one person, say your grandmother? Now, when these were kind of postulated, I think it was in the 1960s, these were seen as hypothetical. They were seen as being um, almost like a thought experiment rather than something that people thought would actually necessarily exist. The reason why they, um, people were looking at that is that at the time, and I'll, I'll talk about it in more detail in another lecture, was the idea that you kind of see complex things by building them up from the parts of simple things. So you might have some neurons that respond to, to dots, some neurons that respond to edges, some neurons that respond to surfaces, some that respond to two surfaces together. And the idea is that you're kind of building up from simple to complex. And there is good evidence for that, but the question is how complex is complex? Where is this uh, kind of going? And obviously this connects with the idea of, you know, kind of cognition and the, the kind of mental things that, uh, that we have. So uh, our kind of thoughts of different people. So I'll, I'll come back to that and the, the evidence for and against. But basically, um, what we can do is that we can record um, the electrical activity of the brain. Now, these are recording methods, by which I mean that you are not stimulating the brain with electricity, which is what Penfield did. The brain, as I'm thinking and speaking now, is letting off uh, electrical currents. And you can detect those by putting something on my scalp, 
that's EEG or event-related potentials, or you can <coughs> record them by sticking an electrode inside my brain, and that's a uh, single cell or recordings. Yeah. But you are, you're recording rather than stimulating. So single cell recordings uh, measure action potentials per second, and what you would typically have is that you would have an awake or anaesthetized animal with um, uh, electrodes uh, in its head. It could be rats, cats, so on. You would then present lights or sounds, for instance, on a uh, screen through headphones, and you would record how that neuron responds. So how many action potentials does it uh, produce in response to a, a bar of light down here, for instance, versus a bar of light up there. Now, this tends not to be done in humans, by and large, because it is an invasive procedure. Obviously, you need to open up uh, the head. But it can be done in patients who are having surgery. And again, this might be surgery for epilepsy, well, it typically is, including the, uh, like the patients that Penfield was uh, exploring uh, half a century ago. How is it that, um, that the neuron kind of, neurons kind of represent uh, the visual world? Well, if we stick with the idea of face perception, um, several studies have looked at this in, uh, in, in primate or have looked at different ways in which they do it. So, for instance, Rolls and Deco summarise different ways in which you might represent faces at the level of individual neurons. One is that you might have what's called a local code. So this is equivalent to gram number cells. So you might have one neuron that responds to this face and no other faces, another neuron that responds to this face and no other faces, uh, and so on. Alternatively, what you might have at the other end is what's termed a fully distributed representation. And what this means is that neurons respond to every face that's out there, but they might respond to one face more than another. But you're never going to be able to look at a single neuron and figure out what's there. Instead, what you have to do is look across all the neurons and then say, oh, well, uh, this particular pattern, it looks like that face, this particular pattern looks like this face, uh, and so on, uh, that you're having to make that. An alternative is something intermediate, where basically you've got things that are distributed, but they're quite sparse. So neurons respond to several faces, but not every face. So they, they are more finely tuned. And the evidence is more consistent with the third. It's, uh, there's certainly little uh, evidence for the second, depending on where you're looking at and how long. So this is evidence from, um, uh, from uh, recordings in a uh, primate cortex where A, B, C, D, and E are five different faces, okay? Uh, sorry, the, so these here are five different faces, okay? That's one neuron. This is another neuron. So there are four neurons that have been shown, five faces and five objects. So all of these neurons um, prefer faces. What does it mean to prefer faces? It means that they produce action potentials uh, to a face, but not to other objects. That's all it means. Who knows what the neuron actually likes, but, but that is the kind of the, the language uh, that's used. So none of these neurons show much of a responsiveness, actually, to uh, non-face objects. In other parts of the brain, you would get the reverse. Yeah. Uh, do they look at um, monkey's faces or human? Ah, they've done it with both, and actually they, they tend not to... Um, these neurons tend not to care so much about this. I think in this case, it might have been monkey's faces in this particular study. Um, you, you, yes, it's quite surprising that, uh, that they're not as finely tuned as you would imagine uh, to that. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Um, so here you can see that, well, you could, you could make a claim that this one looks a little bit like a random cell to any response to this one face, but of course you've only probed it with five in that instance. But the general pattern looks a little bit more like the others where neurons <laughs> respond to multiple faces and other ones. But again, this might be uh, a good kind of code because it enables you to generalize, it enables you to say, oh, this face looks a little bit like that face be because faces change over time. You don't want your neural representation to be too fixed or too narrowly tuned because if, for instance, I grow a mustache or something, you don't want to fail to, to recognize. But it has to have some variability uh, within uh, the, the code itself in order to be able to cope with that. And this is um, a kind of a computational model that, that's been based on, uh, uh, on this. Uh, uh, and again, I, I don't know, 
whether this is actually based on humans who can recognize thousands and thousands of faces. But, but if you look at kind of um, the level of tuning that neurons have to faces, that you could probably detect who are unique faces from as few as 200 neurons um, in the brain, where you've got billions and billions of um, so th this is just a mathematical technique that if neurons represent faces like this, how many neurons would you need in order to, to do that? But neurons can show a surprising specificity. So this is a different region of the brain um, that seems to respond to kind of more social cues. So where people are looking, is somebody looking at me or are they looking away? So some neurons would respond to kind of direct, uh, I'm looking at you in the eye because this is a very socially... Uh, salient if not threatening kind of cue. Uh, this particular neuron actually does the opposite. So this neuron here uh, responds strongly when the person is looking down. So here her head is looking down, here her eyes are looking to the side, here her eyes are looking down, and here her eyes are looking up. So the neuron responds to downward gaze, so this, to this stimulus and this stimulus. That's kind of interesting because these two stimuli don't really look like each other. These three stimuli kind of look the same superficially. So this neuron is processing some kind of information that, that is not strictly visual. It's processing something that is more abstract or you could even say kind of conceptual about where somebody is looking. Um, so this is a downward one. You, you would have some neurons for downward, some neurons for straight ahead and so on. You would have a whole kind of code for where so it's not just, um, you can look at this for, uh, for kind of abstract as well as. Uh, so this takes us to, to Jennifer Aniston, which um, basically this was a, a set of studies that were done in humans. Um, whereas most of the, the primate studies have been done in uh, parts of the brain involved in vision, the ones in humans were done in the medial temporal lobes in the hippocampus. The reason they were done in this region is that they were, this is where a lot of epilepsy <coughs> foci are. So it's already a different region of the brain to the, the, the primates anyway. That's more to do with memories and to do with kind of higher level information. So what happens to these patients is that they have um, electrodes implanted in their, their head. They, they're kind of attached uh, at the skull, so they would have wires coming out that they can literally just plug into a unit. If they go to the toilet, they can unplug them and go uh, to the bathroom and then plug them in again. But they literally sit there in the hospital bed reading Hello! magazine and other things with these recordings in there where the surgeons try and figure out where the, uh, the epileptic foci kind of are in their head. What you can do is, whilst they're reading Hello! magazine and so on, you can literally just record in the oscilloscope what... Uh, you know, if a neuron is kind of responding to whatever it is that they're reading or seeing. And what you might then find is, oh, the neurons seem to like that particular photo. So the experimenter goes to Google search, types in the word Jennifer Anderson, it downloads all the photos of Jennifer Anderson, see, is it true that it responds to lots of different images of that person? So these experiments are almost done kind of in real time. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, the, the, the setup, the, the, the experimenter goes away and does this. And this is the kind of surprising uh, things that they found. So the images from 32 to 28 are different images uh, of uh, Jennifer Anderson. Again, what the representation here is that you've got uh, time on the, the x-axis, and going above, it's kind of a histogram of how often the neuron fires. So the neuron fires more to her than to others. It, it, it doesn't refer, um, fire to her in the presence of her ex-husband, Brad Pitt, which... Uh, there are certain ways in which you, you would have information from two neurons where one can inhibit the other. It's, it's a little bit like an electrical wiring diagram where one could be on, one could be off, and the, it makes a decision as to how to do that. So, again, it, it, it's uh, interesting. Here, these are just the, these 90 images that, that this neuron was shown. Obviously, the, the person's eyes are shown if you're recording from a and it responds to uh, all those Jennifer Anson images. Here, this is the, the Halle Berry neuron, uh, for instance. Uh, the, these are kind of different patients. So they respond to, the, in this case, the word Halle Berry. I realise you can't read that, but it's just the printed white on black word a sketch of her. It doesn't respond to, uh, it responds to Halle Berry dressed as Catwoman, but not other actresses dressed as Catwoman, um, for instance. 
uh, for buildings and things, you tend not, you don't get exactly the same specificity. This is your one that responded to the Sydney Opera House and actually a temple that looks a little bit like the Sydney Opera House, for, for instance. Uh, so it's, it's certainly not just that. And let me show you uh, a little video of this. I, I kind of embedded it, but it's not. My research is in neuroscience. I'm very interested in how the brain works. And we study different aspects of brain functioning. Specifically, we are interested in perception, how do we see, and in memory, how we can form new memories and how we can recall experiences from the past. So the Jennifer Aniston neuron was a neuron I found in one patient some time ago that fired to many different pictures of Jennifer Aniston. So these are recordings that are done for clinical reasons, I mean, to try to cure a patient from epilepsy and this allows us the opportunity to record single cells in human subjects. So what I found is that in this patient I show many different pictures of Jennifer Aniston and the neuron fire and I show many other pictures of other people and the neuron did not. So basically what this means is that there are neurons in the human brain that represent concepts, I mean as opposite to particular visual features of one picture or the other. So basically building up from the finding of these Jennifer Aniston neurons, we realize they are neurons that represent concepts. And these neurons are actually in areas that we know that are very well, I mean very much involved in memory. For this we did an experiment that was done by Matthias Sison, who is a lecturer here in the center and also at the engineering department. And what Matthias did, he was showing different people in different places, like for example Jennifer Aniston by the Alfeld Tower and so on. So then we saw that the neuron that was originally firing to a person, say to Julia Roberts, the moment the patient remembered the new memory, start firing also to the associated place, like the White House. And this happened even after one trial. So, and that's critical because this shows for the very first time how neurons can encode memories even after one presentation, which is what happens in the human brain, because we only need to see something once to be able to remember it. The impact of these findings is to understand a very basic mechanism of memory formation. And I think this is, has a huge impact for basic neuroscience because the long-term possibility that that might be helpful for pathologies like Alzheimer's disease. And this is because Alzheimer's involves exactly the area that we study, which is the hippocampus. So we want to understand Alzheimer's disease and potential treatments. You first have to understand how the normal brain works. And when we understand the mechanism of the normal brain, we can wonder what happens in the pathological cases so that leads to, to these devastating conditions.